of the other people. They won't give you any indication and yet you are playing for your life. So in a sense, we can view the bars around the world as these private acting guilds that run these plays for which only they know how to partake. Well, I want to clear that up first because knowledge is power and certainly secret knowledge is absolute power. And this understanding of all the world is a stage has in fact been a very important part of the secret knowledge of the bar for far too long. Taught to only a select few that then go on to administer the system. Well, if you look at Shakespeare, and I won't go into the Jesuit College of English and their role in the creation of Shakespeare, but if you look at the plays of Shakespeare and the three acts, remember we've spoken about three acts and the act of penance in the three acts of the, of the accusation, the confession, the absolution. If you look at those plays, one thing that really should strike anyone is that those plays are, in, in fact, detailed cases pertaining to law. Yes, they're entertainment, but they are also dramas pertaining to law. Some of them pertain to property and murder and contract and all aspects of contract from marriage right through to the pound of flesh, Merchant of Venice. So if you look at the Shakespearean plays from one perspective, they are in fact the instruction manual on how to conduct a drama, how to conduct a theatrical production in the court. And in fact, for years and years and years, Shakespeare was a required component of the training, and still is in, in some quarters, a required component of training for lawyers and for judges and, uh, of course, for prosecutors. But before the bar came and created extraordinary corruptions in the way that they conducted their business, for thousands of years it was known in Greece, in Rome, in civilizations around the world, that after events had, had occurred, after the present moment had passed, when there was an offence and there was a requirement to redramatize previous events, the similarities between a drama, a dramatization of claimed factual evidence and the dramatization of a wholly fictional story was just matters of degree, was just matters of perception. It's why court was held in theatre. Literally, in Greece, they were held in the amphitheatres, the same places that productions were held. Why? Because the same mechanics were important. Now, they weren't perverting law. They weren't viewing the law as, as something to be trivialised. They were merely recognising a fact that is hidden from us. And that is, I can tell you what I experienced, and you may also have been present at the same point in time. But my perception and your perception will be different. We may agree. And if we agree collectively, then that does not necessarily represent the true, unique experience I had and the, new, and the unique experience you had. We are creating a fiction for the sake of arbitration, for the sake of agreement, for the sake of moving forward. We are, in fact, creating a fiction. But a necessary fiction a fiction so we can rebalance and resolve issues of injury, concern, controversy. So what Section 5 is doing in the positive law now will be giving some understanding to these crucially important elements of an occurrence, of recreating past events and what do we mean by drama, scene, dramatist person, personae, a party, the role of a spectator, the role of an actor, the protagonist, the antagonist, the, the accomplice which we describe as the deuteragonist, the plot and the motive. Yes, these, these terms sound exactly like you're putting on a play. And in fact, you are. But my hope 
is in understanding these foundations, and they are in fact foundations of positive law from the very beginning, which is why I believe that there is a gap in not having them there and why I believe they play an important part of all our understanding. Why I, I hope that this will be proven to be very useful and important for everyone is it evens the playing field when we're dealing with the bar because the bar and certainly the lawyers are quite happy to perform, to act, to practice. But their ignorance of why is extraordinary. And if you understand why, if you become a master of the art, remember, they call it the art. The art of the word, and we've been working very hard on the art of the word, but the art of the act, the art of the presentation, the performance. If you become a master of the performance, knowing why, why it is that this occurs, then God help the bar. And if enough people become masters of the performance, then God help them because there will be nothing that can withstand your competence, your power and your ability. You will become stars, truly. But you need to know and you need the tools. So in occurrence, we talk about these elements and then we talk about fact and how fact is used. Method, source, reference, verification. And then we talk about evidence and the elements of evidence and how that ties in. So this is an important section. Now let me move on to the second edition. And it is the addition of argument. Let me apologise. And I, I mentioned this earlier, but I want to apologise to everyone because I've said, stand competent, you're the magic bullet, you don't need the paper. But really, for weeks and for months, it, it never occurred to me that the tools of logic, the tools of dialectic and the tools of rhetoric are just not taught. They're not taught anymore. So how can someone really stand there in confidence if they don't know the tools? No wonder people go back to paper because really you haven't been exposed to these areas of logic. So what we're doing in section six now of positive law is that we are identifying these elements. What is argument? What is reason? What is interpretation? Proposition, conclusion. What is system? What is validity? What is maxim? Status, competency. Logic. What do we mean by logic? Logic is a bivalent system. The universe is not bivalent. Bivalent, by, we mean two. The universe is multivalent. A and or B. It's not black and white. When Aristotle formulated his system of logic, he used it as a way of control. It's why it is still such an important tool today of control. It's why they don't teach it anymore because it is a tool of control. Logic is a way of arguing where you can tilt the scales in your favour. Once you know how to argue in logic, how to arrive at inference, the first premise, the second premise, the conclusion, the concepts of syllogism, how, how to conduct a form of deductive logic, deduction by the, uh, the connection together of certain premise to a conclusion, or inductive logic, which is based on the evidence before us, we can infer the following. Once you see those elements, then you can debate every much in the manner of the courts. Now, you've probably heard of, of uh, realism or legal realism, which is the du jour of the bar today. And what supports realism, they would claim, is science and fact. But really, it is underpinned by logic. Logic gone mad, I might suggest. And that argument and reason has been relegated to secondary. It's still there. <coughs> but logic and in particular dialectic, which we'll talk about in a moment, are the tools that underpin that. So now having these maxims, these canons that explain what is logic, what is inference, what is logical form, 
what is deductive, inductive, what are fallacies, all the elements that you need to understand logic. These, I hope, will be tools so that any of you, all of you, will know exactly how the courts are framing their own conduct and you can deal with it. Let's talk about dialectic. If you look up dialectic in any of the uh, modern dictionaries, they say that dialectic is really just a form of logic. Well, it's not. <clears throat> it is, whereas logic is simple statements coming together to form an inference, dialectic is the composition of ideas to form a result. It is really loading the, do the dice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dialectic is used to ram home an advantage because the system itself or creates a bias that in most cases can't be overcome. One of the classic is this. This is a dialectic. Thesis followed by antithesis followed by synthesis. That is the essential element of dialectic. And in fact, one of the most uh, famous uh, phrases is they call Hegelian dialectic. Well, Hegel never even used thesis, antithesis and synthesis. He never claimed it to be. It just became a, a frame of reference. And guess who loves using Hegelian dialectics or dialectics of thesis, antithesis and synthesis? Yep, it is the favourite tool of the bar and it is the favourite tool of the Jesuits. Well, what do I mean? Okay, thesis. Terrorism is on the rise. Terrorism is dangerous. Terrorism threatens a way of life. This is a thesis. Sound familiar? Antithesis. We need a war on terror. A bit like we need a fire on fire. <laughs> we need a war on terror. What does that produce? Well, it produces more terrorists. And because more terrorists have been produced, we need more laws to protect us. Synthesis, Patriot Act, screening in airports. Going to the airport is like having an enema and a biopsy and a Spanish Inquisition all rolled in one. Who wants to fly after you've been thoroughly degraded the way they do it now? Totally unnecessary, totally and utterly unnecessary. Why? Because that is how they want to run. They don't want us to travel anymore. And if you travel, they want to let you know that they are in control. It's an easy way for them to exert their control at the ports, always has been. Synthesis. So, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, dialectics, actually allow you to put bias. But remember, two can tango on this. And once you know, once you know these tools, then you will be every bit as formidable as any judge that is totally uh, sold on realism. And, of course, you'll have all the other tools of logic, argument, the ecclesiastical knowledge of the courts, the history of the courts, the history of the law. These are the tools that's been missing. Well, let me move to rhetoric. Rhetoric from Greek simply means public speaking. <clears throat> but when it was created, again, by our friend Aristotle, it meant more than that. It meant the art of persuasion, the ability to speak, to orate, and to do it in such a manner that you can persuade a particular audience. Now, it is still today the most powerful tool when one is dealing with the law. So, it is an area that has been absolutely taken out of history, it's not trained, it is not taught. Now, when we mean public speaking, we don't simply mean by getting up and, and trying to emulate Obama. Obama makes great speeches. He's a great orator. But I'd suggest to you that he even himself doesn't understand necessarily the art of rhetoric. 
he knows the art of manipulation, crowd manipulation, but he certainly doesn't know the art of rhetoric because the art of 